In the last episode of History of the Earth, we finally saw life get its proper start. Pretty much every group alive today can trace its ancestors back to this time when life was exploding in diversity. Even if it was ancestors that don't look at all like animals that we would know today. Just try to bear with me, because we still have a long way to go. We left off 485 million years ago, with an extinction that brought the Cambrian to a close. We lost a lot of the specialized radiodont apex predators like Anomalocaris, but many groups, like the ever-enduring Trilobite, continued to press on. And over the next 41 million years, life will flourish, and the torch will be passed to new players on this stage of our planet, as we get into the Ordovician period. And what better way to kick off this new period in Earth's history than with another round of adaptive radiation to fill the void left by all the species who died out at the end of the Cambrian? The interesting thing about looking at a map of what we think the continents looked like at this time is that it's literally the exact opposite of the world we know today. Today we see most of the joined landmasses primarily across the northern hemisphere. But during the Ordovician, the entire northern half of the planet was covered in a massive ocean called the Pantalassic Ocean. The southern hemisphere was dotted by islands and smaller continents, and one massive landmass that extended from the South Pole all the way to the equator. This supercontinent was called Gondwana, a massive slab of desert made up of what would eventually become South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, the Indian subcontinent, Zealandia, and Arabia. These continents were, as far as we could tell, pretty much barren going into the Ordovician. There might have been colonies of cyanobacteria along the coast, but especially inland would have been entirely empty. But all that was about to change, because the very first forms of complex life were about to make the leap from the ocean onto dry land. This might seem like a small change, but it is another major step in creating the world that we know today. It was around this time that the very first terrestrial plants evolved. Now we haven't checked back in with the plants since during the Proterozoic, and that's because it seemed like they didn't really diversify much during the Cambrian, mostly staying microbial in the form of algae and surviving in the shadow of the cyanobacteria. But as they would start to move on to land, at first they would kind of resemble tiny non-vascular plants like liverworts. But as time went on and they adapted to life in the open air, they would evolve to be able to produce the very first spores. And it's from this very humble beginning that all complex plant life gets its start. And who knows, if plants didn't make this journey first, maybe animal life would have never crawled out of the sea in the first place. Because after all, beforehand there really wasn't any reason to. Over the course of the Ordovician, animal life started to bounce back from what happened at the end of the Cambrian. And by about the halfway point, the diversity of life seemed to have been back on the upswing. Many of the bizarre life that had existed previously had faded into extinction, but several others did manage to hang on. And these were the ancestors of what was about to come next. The Radiodonts will always be able to claim the title of the first super predator. But by the Ordovician, it seemed like those days were over. However, not all of them were completely wiped out. The ones that survived would be the ones that took on a bit of a different strategy to feeding than the hyper carnivores we discussed in the last episode. They would become filter feeders and take advantage of the bounty of microscopic organisms that had been filling the ocean since all the way back in the Archean. Maybe this became a more viable way to survive when many of the larger prey animals died out at the end of the Cambrian period. But this seems to have served them well, because as a result of this new lifestyle, the Radiodonts were one of the first large animal groups to recover. And beyond that, they actually got even bigger than they were before. Aegirocassis was among the largest at 2 meters long and twice the size of Anomalocaris. This is the earliest known giant filter feeder, an evolutionary strategy that will be copied many times throughout Earth's history including by the mammals hundreds of millions of years later, to create the largest member of that class of animals as well. By about 467 million years ago, the plant seemed to be back on track and was pretty well recovered from the Cambrian extinction. The trilobites were literally everywhere again, the radiodonts had 
settled into their new role as gentle filter feeding crab monsters and we vertebrates were hanging on trying our best to get by in an arthropod world things were actually going pretty well um, and it seems like things were only going to get better from here uh, the oceans were once again flourishing with life uh, what tim tim what do you want we have a situation what situation i was just saying how things were go oh well so much for that Things were going well until about the halfway point of the Ordovician, when there seems to have been a sudden, rapid increase in impacts from meteorites. This was a result of things continuing to break up in the inner solar system at this time. But what's really strange is, despite some estimates saying that the Earth was experiencing a hundred times as many impacts compared to what we have today, this doesn't seem directly connected to any mass extinctions. In fact, after this point, life just kept trucking along, and became even more diverse. Wait. Woohoo! What now? then. For millions of years at this point, there have been chordates. But we have lived in the shadow of the arthropod masters of the world, as well as other invertebrates. And for the most part, the very first chordates more resembled hagfish and lampreys than any other true bony fish. And I use the term chordate rather than vertebrate because at that time our ancestors didn't even have a true backbone yet. But the next step in our evolution would take place here in the Ordovician, with the appearance of my next form, our Andaspis. Now even though I wouldn't say that we're exactly ready to take over the world yet at just 15 centimeters or 6 inches long, in terms of our evolutionary history, these guys are a pretty big deal. At this point, it's believed that Arendaspis was one of the first vertebrates as well as one of the first true fish. Even though it didn't have any jaw or fins yet, it was probably able to get around using its tail similarly to a modern tadpole. It was probably a filter feeder. They stuck to the shallow water coastlines of Gondwana and pretty much left the open oceans to the arthropods. And to help with protecting themselves from any possible confrontations that they might have, these early fish would develop protective armor on their heads and the front of their bodies. A feature that might seem strange compared to fish today, but it would prove a trait that would one day give our ancestors a fighting chance in the race for life. And despite still being at something of a disadvantage, the first fish were obviously doing something right, since they even started to diversify into other species, like Sacabambaspis. Oh, hey Tim Tim. How are we doing? I think things are going pretty well. We're better protected than we've ever been, and the only radiodonts that are left are basically filter feeding crab whales. I feel like we might be forgetting something. Well, what do you mean? Well, if the radiodonts are no longer a threat, something else has to be driving our evolution into these more defensive forms. I hate when you're right. Release the carrot krakens! Have you ever seen fossils that look like this? Normally clusters of multiple cone-shaped cylinders that polish up really nice. They're one of the most common fossils that are collected besides ammonites and trilobites. But a lot of people collect these without ever realizing what an important piece of the past they have. These are the remains of the shells from one of the most prolific predators the world has seen up until this point. An actively mobile carnivorous cephalopod called Orthoceros. Now we talked briefly about how cephalopods may have gotten their start all the way back in the EDI. But it was kind of hard to say for sure, because most cephalopods don't fossilize really well. You know, since they don't have any bones. So there are a few trace imprint fossils that we think might be early members of this group, but we really can't say for sure. That would all change with the evolution of the subclass Nautiloidea, the group of cephalopods that have a hard shell and includes everything from these guys to ammonites all the way up to modern nautiluses today. Orthoceros is actually a broad term that refers to several different species, ranging in size from little guys the size of your finger, 
all the way up to the 4.5 meter or 15 foot sea monster that seemed like something from an old fisherman's tale. These guys were the rulers of the open ocean, taking over the position of apex predator in every corner of the globe. Their fossils have been found everywhere that there are marine deposits from this time period. And then on the ocean floor, there was another new group of predators. The very first Eurypterids, or sea scorpions. Despite the name, these marine arthropods are not true scorpions. But they're definitely closer to an arachnid than an insect in body plan because their bodies have two segments, a head and an abdomen. And I'll definitely be getting into them more as we go forward in time. But it's definitely worth mentioning that the earliest species of Eurypterid first appeared around the middle Ordovician 467 million years ago. Called Pentacopterus, it also was a considerable sized carnivore. And it probably made the ocean floor every bit as dangerous as Orthoceros made the open ocean. And all these were probably the reasons why, even after evolving the defensive armor of our early ancestors, the first fish were still confined to the shallow coasts. Most of the large animal roles were still being filled by invertebrates, leaving our ancestors confined to areas where we could better avoid them. However, as these giant cephalopods and arthropods became more and more specialized, it may have left them at something of a disadvantage for what happened next. As we go forward in time, the periods of geological history are almost always concluded with a major drop or change in global biodiversity. It's the reason why scientists looking at the fossil record are able to say that this is a point in time when one geological period ends and another begins. So this will become a reoccurring theme in the History of the Earth videos. That being said, however, there are only five events that have led to such a catastrophic loss of life that they are actually considered one of the true mass extinctions. These are normally defined as an event where 70% or more of the species on Earth are wiped out at that time. And as we get into the late Ordovician from 445 to 440 million years ago, we come into the first of these great dyings. This happened over the course of 5 million years because of wild swings in the global climate. It started out with a glaciation that led to lower sea levels and cooler ocean temperatures. This likely destroyed the habitats that the early fish relied on for protection from the invertebrates. And had that been the end of it, life would have likely quickly recovered. But following the glaciation, the climate would do a complete 180 and switch from an ice house to a greenhouse. And this is when things would go to a critical point. Climate change will always lead to extinctions of the most specialized species, but the more generalized ones will always manage to pull through. But rapid climate change from one extreme to another can push things to the absolute limit. And then things got even worse. Because as the oceans heated up, the amount of oxygen in the water would start to plummet. And that's never good for animal life, which at this point still lived exclusively in the water. But you know what it is good for? Cyanobacteria. That's right, it's time for the return of the goo. As the cyanobacteria spread across the anoxic oceans of the late Ordovician, they literally choked every marine ecosystem. And by the end of this roller coaster of events, a staggering 85% of the species on Earth were wiped out, making this extinction event well within the qualifications of one of the big five mass extinctions. In fact, despite this one being one of the least well-known, it's actually one of the worst. As the Ordovician comes to a close, we're left with a truly sick planet and there will be no swift, explosive comeback that we've seen before. This level of cataclysm will take some time to recover from, but we still have about 444 million years to go to get back to the present, so life will inevitably find a way. I want to thank everyone who has joined me on this journey through Earth's past. I really like the way that these videos have been turning out, and I'm absolutely thrilled at how well received they are, and I haven't even gotten into any of the really popular stuff yet. If you haven't yet, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss an upload. But that's all I have for today. I hope everyone is well. And if not, just remember, as bad as the state of the world is, it has been worse before. So stay strong, and we will find a way.